Arfield. One up her leg. Scott Arfield. He's been threatening that recently. And all the Burnley players run to the Darwin end. Burnley win the next ball. It's a Rory now. It's on the outside. He's on the It quickly finds Benson in space at the byline. Can Burnley get a goal here? Back for Brownell. Saved by the keeper. Yeah! Burnley won it to the end. That is magnificent. They deserve that. Only by Paul Fantella. Off for a hat trick. He's got it. Hat trick for Nathan Teller. Oh, he's on fire at the minute. 3-0 Burnley. It's Nathan Teller's day. And he's on the outside, comes inside, comes on the shot, oh what a goal, Manuel Benson once more, that is top class, Burnley have done it, fantastic, Claris deserve the championship title, they've been the best side throughout the campaign, Burnley have won the second tier, what a fantastic achievement, the players have been magnificent. Yes, hello everyone and welcome along to the latest episode of the pre-game show here on Turfcast with me, Joe Revend, and as usual, a fan of the opposition. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by Graham from the What The Fork, F-A-L-K, before somebody has a go at me for an early swear, uh, the What The Fork podcast. How are you doing, mate? Yeah, not bad. Um, really excited to kind of get stuck into it because football's great, isn't it? We can both agree on that. It's been great. Yeah, to, uh, a good start for both of us. And let's get into that straight away. Then, obviously, a great start for Sunderland. Scored six goals. Not quite nine, but, you know, it's still impressive. Um, but you haven't conceded yet as well, which is a bit more impressive than our measly one goal conceded at Luton. What do you put this good start down to? Obviously, new manager as well. We'll get into that in a minute. I do want to chat about him. But what do you put this good start down to? Because I think a lot of people thought Sunderland would be there and thereabouts for like the top six sort of thing. I think that's where I would have had them, but not necessarily top two, but it's looking like, you know, if you carry this form for the, the rest of the season, you'll be knocking on the door. But um, what what's this great start down to, mate? The, the really obvious part, um, first and foremost, which sounds really daft, is we've played really well. Um, <laughs> that's kind of the first part of it, but... <laughs> But why have we played so well? Because a lot of people will be going, I think we won like two in the last 14 and everyone saw what happened with the managers last year. Yeah. And of course, the manager, which we'll, we'll get more stuck into, has had an impact. But there's been players that have been injured for a long time last year that you kind of forgot, not existed, but like forgot how big of an impact they were, have yeah. come back into the side. Dennis Serkin's a massive plus. Um, I'm sure there's fans across the country that will disagree, but a fit Dennis Serkin. I'm not going to say he's the best left-back in the league, but he is someone who I think is Premier League ready, which is a big compliment. Uh, the problem is he's most of the time at Sunderland been made of what's it, uh, which isn't great. Uh, but when he's back on the team, he, he just he's a natural left-footer that can defend well and he attacks really well and overlaps perfectly. And there's another guy who we still have, thankfully, at the moment, that, well, at the time of speaking, which is the 21st of... August, six minutes past eight. Um, that gets a bit more space when he plays, and that's Jack Clark. But the the first game of the season, we signed Alan Brown from Preston. And yeah. I think, you know, last time we spoke, we probably spoke about how young our team was. That team has now got two years' worth of experience. They're not as new and as fresh as maybe they were two years ago. On top of that, we brought an experience in Alan Brown, who played the first game. He didn't play against Chef Wed, so I can't use him as an excuse for playing well. But on top of that as well, you've got some really good young players coming through. I mean, I think the average age of our midfield on Saturday was 19. Um, but within that, you've got Chris Rake, who's 17, who's played about, I'd say, 20 first-team games. He played a lot towards back end of last season. Dan Neal's been a first-team regular and is now the captain. He's played three, four, it'll be fourth full season, I think now. And Joe Bellingham was played literally every minute he could do last season, which wasn't always beneficial, but it's mm. it's going to be benefiting him now. So I think it's a combination of, look, winnable games, 
new players coming back. Uh, oh, sorry, new old players coming back feeling like new sign-ins. Jack Clark still being there. Patrick Roberts showing a bit of form, and the midfield being really, really, really good. Uh, but there's still players that are injured, like Dan Ballard still missing at the moment. Uh, Alan yeah. Brown missed the game on on Saturday, so hopefully it gets better. But if you'd asked me two weeks ago, you know, are Sunderland ready for a promotion push? I would have gone, well, we need to sign a striker, and there's probably X, Y, and Z. So. Do we need more to sustain it? Yeah, probably because those players, are, even if they have a really good season fitness-wise and comparison to what they've had, are not going to remain fit all season. But um, we've got a good team when everyone's fit. We are missing a striker, although Mayenda, who hasn't scored since he signed, scored two on Sunday, so maybe we don't. But we've got a good young team, and when they're playing well, like we are difficult to stop. Uh, you saw that for 45 minutes. Um, yeah. And we saw what you did for 45 minutes last time we played each other at the Stadium Light. But I'm glad you uh, mentioned that game because yeah. I have I have chosen this top specifically <clears throat> to try and give you PTSD. I have intentionally chosen this top from that game. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that game. Um, but I do... Game, you, 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 yeah, it was a brilliant game. Obviously, I remember at half-time being absolutely furious <laughs> and then at full-time, obviously being delighted. And the famous meme of the Sunderland content creator, not yourself... Um, Who's it is uh, funny uh, uh, under in the in the concourse at half time saying it's two two against a very good Burnley side and you can hear the the faint roar and he goes oh and then goes to turn the camera off it's absolute gold I absolutely love it it uh, is good it is class uh, but you mentioned there that Chef Wednesday game obviously you mentioned you know, your striker getting two goals and stuff like that. I, obviously that I didn't get a chance to watch it against Cardiff because I think we were playing um, well we weren't actually because we played Monday night but I didn't watch it um, I think it was Saturday 3 o'clock weren't it that game so it, it was at 12.30 I think oh was it oh it was on telly yeah. I, I didn't watch it um, but um, yeah like, why, I watched it against Chef Wednesday is the point but you were so good like everything just seemed to click and obviously we've already done a pre-game show on your podcast and your channel sort of thing and you were saying, oh, you went into it thinking it's got to be an entertaining game. I'll probably take like an entertaining draw. But you absolutely blew them away. What went so right for that game? Like, why were you so good, do you think? Um, Again, it was the midfield three. Like, we, we do, like, uh, the review shows. I'm sure every fan podcast does. And we do this thing where we, if we got, like, we normally have four contributors, including myself. And I'll say, like, pick one player out. And by the time it gets like the last person, which is normally me, I'm kind of going, all oh, right, I'm going to have to kind of like pull a rabbit out of the hat here. Literally could have picked 11 players. They all yeah. played so, so well. There was no one less than a seven. Maybe the goalkeeper, because he could have fell asleep if he wanted, but even his <laughs> kicking was decent. Um, the press was really good from the start. I think it was a combination of, like, our new manager wants us to play out from the back, but also a high press, which is not like revolutionary, but it's good when it works, especially if you got high energy young players that want to do that they want to run they're all excitable because they're all 17 18 year old and they just want to run about mm. and do stuff um and i think i think chef Wed came with more confidence than they probably should have done like they played us our last home game last season was chef Wed, and they beat us 2-0 and it was comfortable and we were all out of sorts and we looked awful and we were like god just end the season like we need so many changes they came up against the sunland side who had a good start of the season it was confident and we said last year, like a lot of the time, because of the youthfulness of our squad, do you remember being a kid? If you did something good, you were like walking on air for the next week. If you did something yeah. bad, you hated yourself. You were the worst person. And that probably does the same, which is probably why we said we wanted so much, ex well, not so much, but more experience in the team this season, which we've sort of added to. But on Sunday, it was just summoned at the best. We just absolutely like smashed them. And I think mm. if you ever want to kind of wonder, you know, when you have one of those days when everything just goes right, like my ender who scored two, he has started the season, but barely played last year. To be honest, he came in as a 17 year old. He looked like nippy, but like raw as hell. And he went on loan to Hibs and couldn't get on the bench for their academy team. So you're kind of thinking, has he got anything? Started against Cardiff. I thought it was a good save, but he kind of missed the sitter. Mm. And then... Josh Windass decided to try and back flick it. It defends, it deflects off our defender and plays my end of clean through. And he just, it's a great finish. And after like 13, 14 minutes, you're going, well, hang on. My end has just scored a beauty. They've kind of set it up for us. We've just got a really well worked, like free kick. Roberts has got an assist. He only got one assist last year. He's already got one this season and he got an assist for an assist last week. 
and things just kind of fell into place. And I think sometimes you'll know what it's like. It was the same when you played us and that second half. It just felt like you were confident as soon as you got one goal and everything yeah. you hit was going to go in the back of the net. And sometimes that just happens. But that is Sunderland at 100%. When we're good, if we played like that every single week, we could go for top two. The proof will be in the pudding, which is why I think this game's so interesting at the weekend because if you win it, you go, oh, hang on a minute. What's happening here? Yeah. You get beat or you draw, you go, oh, okay, like expectations tempered a little bit. Yeah, that's fair enough. Be interesting to see, obviously, how we get on. I think we're thinking kind of a similar thing. Like, if we win, like, okay, especially with the madness of this week, obviously, I'm sure you won't have been paying too much attention to the, the Burnley <laughs> transfer window madness. But, you know, there's been a lot of madness. Um, having said that, there's only been one actually confirmed at the time of recording this. Um, but the rumours are that um, a lot of players will be leaving. So, fingers crossed, obviously, that doesn't happen before. Um, the game, but there's a lot of sort of like anxiety, I think, in the fight in in the in in the fan base um, about um, whether we're going to have you know good enough players and the and the squad the, the squad's going to have gelled. But I do want to talk to you about your manager. Um, I'm probably going to butcher this in my thick Burnley accent. Um, Reggie Labrie, is that how you say Re- it? Regis Labrice. Le- it okay, is. So now I- now you're pronouncing the S's in French. I didn't think you did. Um, apparently, well, apparently yeah, you are. Apparently. Regis Libris. Um, that do- that doesn't sound as French. Regis Libris sounds better. Um, but anyway, obviously, a lot's been made about Scott Parker coming in for our fan base and stuff like that. Um, how's Regis? I didn't say Reggie then. How how's <laughs> Regis got on? Obviously, obviously, I know the proofs in the pudding with the results. Um, but obviously, uh, uh, what's his playing style? What's his sort of like managerial style? Tell me more about him. The best thing about him was um, he got announced to the Stadium of Light on Sunday. And they're like, oh, welcome to the Stadium of Light, Regis Libris. And he kind of just like, everyone's clapping him. And he just went, <laughs> very French. And then later on, we were saying, Reggie, give us a wave. Obviously didn't understand what we were talking about and just continue to kind of have his arms folded and watch the game. So maybe his English chants need a little bit of help. But um you know what? He, he, when he first came in, like I'm not going to say it. Yeah, like oh yeah, a hundred percent knew who this guy was. Didn't have a clue who he was, and yeah. you might have seen, you might not have seen. But between Michael Beale being sacked, obviously we had an interim in charge, and the appointment of Reggie Slabris was 120 days, and those 120 days were long because, as lovely as Mike Dodds is, and as much as he's best mates with Jude and Joe Bellingham, he's not a manager. Like, at all. We were dreadful last season um, as soon as he took over. Potentially even worse than we went to Michael Beale, which is some some feat. So it was a long period of time and it caused a lot of anxiety. It caused a lot of frustration. And you suddenly, and me personally, I can only speak for myself, started losing a bit of faith in the board on top of a, a million different things, which would need a whole other podcast for. But like 128 days for a manager, you think... Oh, what are you doing? So when he got appointed, it was kind of like, has he been the first choice? Because we basically like were sending love letters to Will Still, and he was sending them back via the high that, performance yeah. podcast. Oh, I mean, for me, I never wanted them. High performance podcast is a massive, massive red flag. Um, Jake Humphries full stop is a is a red flag. Just a red flag. Um, <laughs> but it always felt like he was dragging us along a bit and I'll, I'll never know and I'll never really care if I'm honest so when he came in yeah. you were like you know what if he's fifth choice okay but thank god we know who's taking us forward and then you kind of go right is he going to be good oh god he got relegated with Lorient last year and all the Lorient fans in the uh, sorry Lorient uh, all the fans in the, the the chat were like ha 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 like well done son and thank you very much for taking him and we were like oh god what's happening here but I got a couple of um, French football experts on and they both kind of said the same they said like look he's a good manager what happened to him last year is he lost a lot of good players he got linked towards a job in I think it was either Nice or Rennes I think he wanted it because he knew he was losing his players didn't get the goal and interview for the job got a bit cheesed off and it was all just a big mess like, mm. alright okay cool um, but it was mainly the fact that he lost all of his best players because they apparently were like a selling club and had like two three 20 million pound players so I thought well that's good um pre-season was like all right you can't really judge too much but the last game we played was against Marseille in Bradford for some reason um I think it was because the stadium was getting that new pitch or something like that yeah. so we played Marseille who were a decent side they won 5-1 at the weekend so they're decent they beat Brest at the weekend um 
And we played really well. Like they had two moments of quality where you went, okay, there's not much you can do about that. But we drew 2-2, we played well, uh, we looked decent. And you went, well, I kind of understand what he's doing here because it's high press. But I also feel like there's times when, from what I've seen so far, if a team is getting on top of us, it's okay for us to sit back and not dive in and just control it a bit. So it is high press without being constant high press when you get tired. And he likes to pass out from the back, but not to the point where you look like you're going to make a mistake because teams in the championship realistically shouldn't be passing out from the back because they're in the championship for a reason. Um, yeah. Going to make a mistake at some point. So he's got like a good mix. And I quite like the fact that, you know, when he came in, I think people talk about it. Went, oh, you're going to be like Pep or you're going to be like Jurgen Klopp. What are you going to be like? And he's like, I'm going to be like Regis Labris. That's what I'm going to be like. And I was like, well, oh, good answer. He looks like he doesn't smile very often. But, um, he's French. Yeah, well, yeah. He's constantly... I'm surprised he's not constantly black and white and smoking a cigarette. That, that is stereotypical French. The uh, I did a, a QBR podcast at the start, and he kept referring to him as Pepe Le Pew, which I thought was quite funny, to be fair. But um, he's made a really good first impression. Uh, it's hard yeah. to judge if the Chef Red performance is going to be more of a regular, more of a constant, or just a one-off. I would say Cardiff was really impressive. Like We were all buzzing after Cardiff, because I think it's a tough place to go away from home. Like if we had them at Stadium Light and we beat them 2-0, you'd go, maybe that's expected. But away from home, I, I think you've seen them at the weekend and we discussed yesterday. I know you beat them 5-0, but they're not that bad, are they? Are they? Yeah, it were away 5-0. They, they, they were the better side for the first 60 minutes, if I'm honest with you. It's weird. Like They were a decent side. And I looked through their team and I did the preview show and I thought, hang on a minute, they sang Colin Chambers and yeah. got Aaron Ramsey. And I thought, oh, it's not a bad team in comparison to what they've had in the past. But we just like controlled that game. Like quite easily got a goal from a set mm. piece. We we really struggled to score goals from set piece. We scored two and two, which is decent. So hopefully him and his coach and staff have fixed that out. But but his early impressions for me is we play high press without being a consistently high press. He likes the players that express themselves by the looks of it. It sounds really weird, but I noticed something today, and I don't know if it's just me overthinking stuff, but I used to work for a social media team. And it was a case of um, the, the football players would always come in in their kit, their training kit. Every four you had, they were in the training kit. And Sunderland have been yeah. the same like that for a while, especially because everyone likes the new training stuff because we've gone back to Hummel. But the players today were going into training like their normal stuff. And I sometimes think is that like a psychological thing to like let them players express themselves and be who they are. Hmm. And th- we are playing a bit like that, but also as a team. Um, I like the fact that he put Chris Riggin, Alan Brown injured on... Sunday, and he put Chris Riggs straight in his natural position in midfield. Last year, Mike Dodds preferred Callum Styles. I did not prefer Callum Styles to Chris Rigg. Um, so he seems like his history is in academy, and his first manager's job was at Lorient, and it was because they wanted him to produce young players coming through, and he had experience of it. And it looks like that was the reason he got the job here. And it looks like the players are responding to it, but he's got that little bit of experience that maybe the managers last season didn't have, which is going to help him. But early signs are really good. But like I say, if you beat us 4-0 on Saturday, you go, okay, let's reassess. Um, If we win or get a draw, you go, I mean, I I think I I tip Luton to win the league, but I'm wrong. I'm always wrong. Um, I should make my predictions in like April. I think Burnley, I think Burnley will win the league, to be honest. I'm confident the team that we have at the minute wins the league, but I'm not sure what the team is going to be come the end mm. of the window. Like I said, there's a lot of madness at the minute, so we'll see what happens with that one. I still do think we will, but again, it, it depends what the team's going to be on the 1st of September. Ask me again on the 1st of September. You mentioned a couple of bits there about the style of play, um, pressing from the front and things like that. How do you think you'll play against us? Because we let Luton come on to us, and a couple of goals were scored against uh, Cardiff as well were like this. We let Luton come on to us, we invited the press and then we passed it round them or in a couple of cases just put the ball forward and we've scored like three or four goals like that in two games so far. Do you think you will still try and press us from the front and give us the chance to to maybe get in and around the back by doing what we've done to Cardiff and Luton or do you think Regis Labris um, will mix it up a little bit? I think because we're at home we'll at least start like that. If you look at, like, because I remember when we played years, I, I keep referring back to it, the 4-2 game, but it was so contrasting. and was, like, not the best and worst of something, but the best and what can happen when you're not on it in the second yeah. period when you've been a really good team. But that first half, you try to pass it out from the back and you, like, shut it every time we pressed. And you were losing the ball and you were looking like, and we were like, I thought these were quite good at passing out from the back. And then second half, you were really good at 
all the things that we thought you were good at. Yeah. So he's probably going to have to, I think, go at it from the start. I want us to get at you because my personal opinion is there's no one to be feared in this league for any team at any level because the championship is the championship. It's the only league in the world where like the bottom team can beat the top team 4-1 and it doesn't batter an eyelid. You might flicker mm. and go, oh, that ruined me, Aka. that would be it. Yeah. So I'd like us to have a go at you, but I think you need to be a bit more um, tactically astute probably. I think for me, the plan would be get at you, try and nick the ball off your press, Harry at the start, use the energy you've got at the beginning, try and get a two-goal head start again. And then the second half, allow you to have the ball a bit, but you know, don't lose your position. Don't get yourself dragged out of position. Stay resolute as best as you possibly can. It sounds like a really good game, and it sounds like I've won the game for us, but it's a lot harder <laughs> to do. Um, he seems flexible, so I think he can do both, but I would be really surprised if we play at home and sit back. I'd actually yeah. be quite annoyed if we did that. Yeah. I mean, I'd be annoyed if he did that. I think our best hope is for you to come at us. Um, but I do worry about... Uh, the, because even, even against Cardiff, they were pressing us quite well. And like I said, we did eventually score a couple of goals through that. Um, but they were pressing as well. And they had this battering ram up front. I can't remember his name, but they were number 15. And they were putting us under a bit of pressure. Oh, yeah. Ultimately, they didn't they didn't eat the ball off us. Um, and we managed to do quite well. But a team better at it, like a Sunderland, um, could worry me a little bit. Um, I do want to ask about Jack Clark, because you did mention that at the time of recording, as it was, 20-0-6 at that point. He's still not left, I don't think, at 20-23 on the on, on I'm the not counting, of August. <laughs> but it is 20-23, you're correct. <laughs> um, what's the latest with him, then? Is he expected to leave? I would rather him stay at Sunderland than Leeds, for example. I have nothing against Leeds. I've said before, I know a lot of people have this thing where it's cool to hate them. They're just another football club to me. Um but I'd rather him be at Sunderland than be at Leeds because I see Leeds as more of a threat, even though they've not started very well. So I hope you keep hold of him. Um, but is he potentially going to the Premier League or maybe one of the other big leagues in Europe? What's the latest with him? It's eerily quiet, and that's the worrying thing. Um, mm. Last season, it felt like the close we got to January, it was like Jack Clark's going here, this club wants him, that club wants him, Brentford well, we were linked to him quite a lot in the summer, weren't yeah. we? Yeah. Um, News were linked to him. Brentford were linked to him. And at the time, it was like, okay, Brentford, fair enough. I think Palace were linked to him. And you're like, Palace, all right, I hope not. Like, But if we get a big fee, what do you do? Um, yeah. There was Palace rumours at the like time. Good fit, to be fair. It yeah. does. Yeah. I mean, look, I think the likes of, you look at Eze, Mateta, the players that have gone there, Gehi that have gone there and just flourished like he would. But I think at the time, there was a lot of chat about, him not signing a contract and that puts a bit more anxiety into you because you think well if he's not signing a contract then at some point you've got to cash in and how long do you wait until you cash in on big money because the bids like i remember there's a few bids that you were willing to put in for like seven or ten million i thought did they want to buy his right foot or um because like you'd want you'd want 25 million do you know what i mean for a player like that the, the going rate i don't know what players are worth anymore money's mental like yeah. we've got people starving in the street and a problem of homelessness, but players are going for 25 million. So, you know, that's my, my moral weirdness with it. But like, I do think in today's day and age, you'd want at least 25 million because there's also a sell on for your Spurs. You felt like the last game of the season against Chef Wed, he got took off with about three minutes ago for a young academy kid called Tommy Watson. Then he kind of applauded the fans without kind of completely waving them off. And yeah. everyone just went, oh, well, that's Clark, you gone then. Eh? Um, <laughs> And then you started pre-season and you thought, okay, this is good. And you started scoring in pre-season and you're like, oh God, what are we going to do if he goes? And then he's yeah. your top scorer in pre-season and you go, oh no. And he starts the season against Cardiff and you go, well, this is good. And he scores. He does his typical cut inside, stick in the bottom corner. It's easy to see what he's going to do. Very hard to stop it. And then he was phenomenal last week. You know what it is with Clark? I don't think he's unhappy here. I, I hmm. genuinely don't think he's that desperate for a move. But he's got a bit of a pain in the arse for an agent, which is a man called Ian Hart, which me and you will remember. Yeah. Um, who has gone on Twitter. He has gone on Instagram. Yeah, I saw him. I, I, you know what? I didn't realise he was his agent today, but I saw him tweet something. Was it a picture of him celebrating or something he tweeted today or yesterday? Yeah, I he do remember Ian Hart him. from Leeds, um, actually. Loves touting him. Loves yeah. touting him. And bear in mind, he played for Sunderland for a very short while, which is really nice of him. Yeah, I did. didn't remember that. Yeah, I mean, it's best not to be remembered if you're a Sunderland fan, to be honest. But um, <laughs> he 
seems to like really want to tout him out. I think we're all, I don't want to say we're reluctant because we, we, we kind of understand that he might go at some point. Now that it's got to this point, we're kind of going, not at this point, because you cannot spend that money at that point. Yeah. Like the argument is you make big money, then you can sell a player. Leeds have been linked to a left winger today, and I'm praying that they also add Manuel Benson to that because that would really make well, me think. The last, not yeah, Leeds. the last I've heard is that the Leeds are buying this guy. I'll just quickly get his name up now. I want because it's a good name. I can't gone. remember it. Quite yeah, decent. It name. is. Um, where's it gone now? Fabrizio it's, tweeted, didn't he? Uh, he did. Where is it now? I can't see it. But um, yeah, it sounds like Leeds have got the oh, Largi Ramizani. That Great guy. Name. Yeah. Brilliant name. Uh, sounds like it's pretty much there from what I gather. That that lead signing is pretty much there. So yeah. Um I I, I hope we don't give Manuel Benson to Leeds. It looks like he's out of Burnley, but I don't want to sell to a direct promotion rival, right? That would just be silly of us. But yeah, I guess I guess it's good for you. It's looking like Jack's gonna stay, you think? I wouldn't put my house on it, but like for me, I talked about this at the game on Sunday and we discussed about it. And the lad said, Well, what do you do for Jack Clark though? Like take your emotion out of it. What do you do for Jack Clark? If we continue to have a good start of the season, say we get a good result against you, a win or a draw, mm. and then it gets to the end of the window, I think we've got one more game, and you're in the top six, sit down with Jack Clark and be like, we'd love you to sign a new contract. We know you have reluctance at the moment because your agent's a pain in the arse. Stay with us till January and see where we're at. And then when it gets to January, if you're not in the promotion picture or you're not anywhere close to it, then it's probably the benefit of the club to to look at a big fee and it's probably within Jack Clark's benefit to see if he can get a club that will get into the Premier League. I'll tell you the, the big thing I think holds people back on Jack Clark, his spell at Spurs and his loan spells he had after that because he did now with Stoke, he did now yeah. with QPR. He was he didn't even start our player final game against Wickham. He was on the bench, um, really? which is weird. Looking back, um, Elliot Embleton played and scored um, and it worked out that day. But like Jack Clark has grown into like the Jack Clark you, you see here and now in the championship with Sunderland. It wasn't he showed sparks towards the end of that League One season. But I think some clubs are reluctant to pay 25, 30 million for him, which is what we want. And it's got higher because I think previously it was like, oh, we'll accept 17. And then it was like Spurs have a 35% sell on fee close or 25 or something. Um so I think for Jack Clark, he's Going to play in the Premier League at some point. He's a Premier League player, or at least deserves a chance at it. Yeah. But I think some teams are put off by the fact that Spurs bought me sat in the reserves for what two years. Yeah. So maybe we'll stay with us till January, and then we reassess, and hopefully we're in the promotion spot, and we can convince him to sign a new contract, and he has a chance of getting to get into the Premier League with us. But it's very wishful thinking. That. Yeah, I'll be it'll be interested to see what happens. I, I I doubt it goes to another Championship team, even with Leeds having all this money from sales. It, I'd be he, he will go to. A, <laughs> Yeah, it'll go to a Premier League team. And even mm -hmm. though you do say there you want like 20, 25 million, it does sound a lot for somebody, you know, with limited Premier League experience. Um, but like you said, the market's an absolute disgrace these days. And Premier League clubs have that sort of money to take a risk on players because if they lose 25 million, it's a drop in the ocean for them. It's these days, nothing. It? And everyone yeah. lives in debt, doesn't they, pretty much in the Premier League? Pretty they much, yeah. Live by by every sort of single transfer window. And you see the money people are going for. I think we've seen that Alex Scott went from Bristol City and he got like three assists or something the year previous. So immediately you kind of go, right, if he's gone with three assists, Jack Clark scored 17 goals and got like 11 assists. <laughs> we want yeah. at least the same amount. But but money is mad, you're right. It's just yeah. mad. It's It's gone properly off the scales. Obviously, mm. a lot of time spent on Jack Clark there. Understandable. Every Sunderland fan I've, fan I've spoken to over the last couple of days, because I've done some bits for, for a couple of Sunderland websites as well, obviously, did they did your show uh, recently. Every single Sunderland fan has said, other than Jack Clark, which Sunderland player do you like? Or other than Jack Clark, who do you see as the main danger? So I'm going to ask you now the same question. Other than Jack Clark, who should Burnley be worried about on Saturday? I think we've got a better player than Jack Clark. I think Daniel's our best player by far. Um, I absolutely love that Daniel flies under the radar because he's class. He was linked to Liverpool last season, and the biggest compliment I can give him is, yeah, of course he is. Like, why wouldn't yeah. he be? Because the boy's just on a different planet. Like, he is so underrated from outside of Sunderland. It's kind of weird. He's played religiously for us since the League One season where we got promoted, came through our academy. He's now our captain. I think he's 22, and he must be on about 150 games, if not more. 
His range of passing is excellent. He, I mean, the game against Sheffield Wednesday, we talked about Job and how good he was, and we talked about how good Chris Rigg was because they were both brilliant. And I don't want to take anything away from them, but Daniel yeah. just strolled that game. And you know what Sky are like? They're up the arse of Barry Bannon whenever he's on the TV. Like, you, like, and it drives me nuts because I just think Dan Neal just tortured him much better. And maybe I think every team's biased. Maybe every team sees players better. But I, I genuinely feel Dan Neal is already a Premier League player. I can understand why Liverpool looked at him. He's the best academy talent I think we've had since probably Jordan Henderson because you can't really class Pickford as the same position. People will argue Chris Rigg. Chris Rigg's going to be a phenomenal player. I think he's under 19's England captain. There's Premier yeah. League teams already looking at him. I don't quite know how we've convinced him to sign a three-year contract, but it's good news we did because it means he believes in the project here, which is excellent. If we get another couple of years out of him, I'll be delighted. But for me, Dan Neal is by far our best player. Um, he dictates games. When Dan Neal plays well, some of them play well. And I think if you said to me, you can keep one of Daniel and Jack Clark. It, it would be Daniel a hundred times out of a hundred, like without a doubt. That's interesting. Gives me a little bit more anxiety um, for Saturday now that you know we might have to stop two very good players. But let's not forget Joe Bellingham as well. And it's interesting because uh, obviously we've already gone over the half an hour mark. But I do quickly just want to ask you: you've, you've already referenced your midfield already. Um, I feel like. Our midfield is quite good as well, depending yeah. who plays, depending who we keep hold of. If Sander Berg was in there, he, he could have a cup of tea in the middle of the pitch and dictate 99% of games in this league. Premier League player, isn't he? Yeah, but, but he won't be there. Um, it's, it, he's going to Fulham. Um, but how do you think your midfield, which was the beating heart against Sheffield Wednesday, as you've said and as I agree with, because that's what I felt, how I felt you won the battle, how do you think they're going to get on against the likes of a Josh Brownell and a Josh Cullen? Josh Cullen, obviously, the Championship Player of the Year a couple of years ago. Josh Brownell played in and out of the Premier League. Probably too good for the Championship, but not good enough for the Premier League, which kind of personifies Burnley, to be fair. But how do you think your midfield is going to get on against them, them sort of players? I think it's a really good test. And I think whether we win or lose it on Saturday, I think it's probably going to benefit those young lads in the middle. Because for me, like Brownhill is, as you say, he's probably far too good for the championship. He probably hasn't quite done it in the Premier League to the level he'd like to. Josh Cullen, he, well, we saw what he was like last time he played. Um, I think you've arguably on paper, and I know football's not played on paper, got one of the better uh, better midfields in that league. And whilst the likes of Barry Bannon and all that are like loved by Sky and yes, they're all right, okay, they're not bad players. He's actually pretty good. He's got a decent career, better career than me. Um, I think it's a step up on those players. Yeah. If... 17-year-old Chris Rigg, 18-year-old Joe Bellingham and 22-year-old Dan Neal can at least match that midfield. And I mean, whether you match the midfield or not doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win the game. But if they can give them a tough test, it's another kind of... It's another benefit for them. It's, a, it's another experience for them to learn. It's another thing to, to go on and go forth with. I think the beauty of the Burnley game for the squad as a whole is probably that I mean, look, there's no must-win games at this point. But if we lose, no one's going to go, oh, Burnley at home, we've got beat. Oh, tch, shocking. Yeah. I would like a good performance. I think we can beat Burnley. I think anyone can beat anyone at this level. And, like, literally anyone. Like, you got beat of QPR that year when they were awful. Had Gareth Ainsworth We did that intentionally, mate. The, the game after that was black <laughs> run away. We did that intentionally. It was. <laughs> so we, we won the league. Instead of winning the league at home against QPR, we won it at Blackburn. I'm adamant they did it intentionally, mate. I remember what but still. I was in Edinburgh and I remember keeping an eye out for that game because I really wanted to use to win because it like basically buggered Blackburn getting a chance of getting in the playoffs and we still had that chance of getting in at that point. But yeah, I, I do think anyone can beat anyone at this point. Burnley are going to be there or thereabouts, no matter who you lose. Like I don't think that's going to matter because the manager you've got knows how to get out of the league. Even your backup players have got enough. You will bring yeah. players in as you have done today if players go. I think it's a really good test for this squad as a whole because and I've referenced it again, um, the 4-2 game was everything that Sunderland could be in the first half and everything that we need to aspire to kind of match in the second half. I don't think there'll be a similar game because that would be really weird. But I do think Saturday's game is a chance for us to show how far the players have come, how far we can go, but it isn't going to be defining on whether we, we go up or not. Because I think 
unless we have a mad end of the transfer window, which is not going to happen, and sign like four or five strikers and another couple of midfielders and a, a new centre half. I think there'll be a few points difference between Burnley and Sunderland coming into the season. I hope not, but I don't think we're going to be near at the end of the season. I think even if we got fifth or sixth, I personally think like Burnley will probably be quite far away at the top. So I think it'll be a good test for them. Yeah, fingers crossed on that bit, mate. Um, I do. I, I, I literally was on Sky Sports News on Monday or Tuesday. I think it was Monday, and I did predict live on there that we'd win the league. Um, but then the anxiety crept in about, like I said, this mad week um, and Leeds making signings as well. Um, but anyway, uh, that's by the by, obviously. Um, I want to get some predictions. We do normally only have this for around half an hour, but it's good that we're over half an hour. That means that we've, we're having a good chat and you know, you're know you a good talker. Sometimes it's like getting blood out of a stone from a guest. Um, <laughs> Never like that with me, mate. <laughs> I talk far too, far too much, far too much. <laughs> um, predictions, mate. What are your score predictions for Saturday? You can never go against your own team. Um, and I predicted the entertaining draw on Sunday. I think Stadium is a hard place to come for any team. Like, even if you're a Premier League team that's come down there, are expected to win the league. So I think you, I think it will be tough. I don't think he's going to win, but I don't think he's going to lose. I'd be surprised if we blew anyone away the way we did with Chef Wed towards the rest of the season because that was just like a perfect day. We've got goals in us, but I think we're probably going up against the best or one of the best offensive teams as well. So I'm saying 2-2, um, but I am saying that with my head as opposed to my heart, which is a good thing, I think, because you sometimes go with the prediction and say, oh, I'll go with my heart because I can't be on a podcast and say we're going to get beat. But yeah. I'm saying that with my head as, as well as my heart. I think a bit of a people for you, there's a bit of like... Um, I can't think of the word, but like we feel quite nice at the moment. So we're going to head into the game excited. Use it kind of going, oh, this is a bit of a tough game. Yeah. Players, what's going to happen with the players? But you've got enough to get a point at the stadium light and we've got enough to push us, I think. So I think a draw and I think everyone will be happy with that, won't they? Yeah. I, 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 interesting enough, I've said 2-2. Two, two. I don't know why I'm acting shocked and pretending that we're shocked because we, we literally did a show yesterday and we did the same thing. So I'm yeah. going to drop the charade. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I went for 2-2 two, two as well. Um, I just feel that if, if we didn't have this, like Dara Roche is leaving and he's played a massive part in our start. He's so good at the back. He both probably wasn't good enough for the Premier League because he had the lapses in concentration, like probably mm -hmm. once every 90 minutes. But around them 90 minutes, he was absolutely class. But then he'd make a silly mistake and he'd score from it or he'd get sent off like he did at Goodison Park. And he's coming to this league and these mistakes have either been eradicated or you're not noticing them because the championship players aren't good enough to punish us. So he's been very, very good. He he hasn't gone yet. The the you know he may he may still be there on Saturday. There's been nothing to say that he's officially gone, but I don't think he will be there. It's sounding like the news getting closer and closer. So he might have one of these mysterious illnesses um that Anna Sorora and uh, Sander Berg had. Yeah. Transfer box. Uh, so it's uh, interesting. We'll see. But if we bring um, a new defender in, because um, apparently we're looking at Joe Worrell, um, and if we get him in in time, I do think he's good enough for this league. I think he would oh, slot yeah. perfectly right in there alongside Maxime Esteve. Maxime Esteve is a brilliant defender. He, again, will be one of, if not the best defenders in the league. But I, I do worry about this squad upheaval, like you're tearing up a, a team that's done very, very well, and then you know it might take a few weeks to gel. Hopefully not. I'd happily take a defeat this week to win next week against Blackburn. So, you know, if we could come to some sort of arrangement where that happens, I'd, I'd be happy with that. You, mate. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I'll get, I'll get some Blackman fan up for and see if he'll be happy with that. Probably <laughs> not. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go 2 2 as well, just because of that. If it wasn't for that, I'd be going into it thinking, yeah, we can contain and they'll come at us with a load of energy. But, you know, we're a Premier League team full of experience. Well, not a Premier League team, but with ex Premier League players who are good enough. Some are good enough. Some obviously weren't, else we wouldn't have been absolutely diabolical last season. And I would have felt that we would have controlled the game and ultimately just put you to the sword. But because of this upheaval, and I'm not sure who's going to play, um, I am a little bit anxious about it, but I'm going to go 2-2 as well. So, yeah. Uh, I do think it'll be an entertaining game. Two managers that um, are quite new into their jobs, um, have both have good starts, are both going to be full of confidence. So I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a good battle, mate. Yeah, me too. So, um, fingers I'm crossed. For it. Yeah, fingers crossed it's a good one. I think it will be, but fingers crossed, obviously, that we don't come out on the wrong side of it. Um, but before we wrap it up, mate, just want to give you a chance, let everyone know where they can find you, where they can find your content, if they want to digest some Sunderland content. So I don't know about the listeners, but I'm one of them fans. Say, for example, when we beat Luton, 
that night I was watching Luton content like reacting to the defeat. So if we beat you, this might be a chance of somebody to, to log onto your channel and give you some views. Absolutely. And we've got a, the opposition preview side of this. If you want to hear what Joe thinks about yeah. Burnley, whether you agree with them or not, don't abuse them if you disagree. Um, <laughs> but you can find us at all the normal places. It's just, it's just what the folk that's, F A L K. I almost said it phonetically there. Foxtrot Alpha Lima Kilo. There you go. <laughs> um, said that before, haven't I? But it's just um, at what the fog pod on, on Twitter. Like, we, uh, to be honest, we don't take anything that serious. We're just posting yeah, memes at the minute way. because, yeah, it's just football, isn't it? Best way, mate. There's too many prim and proper serious pods out there. I, I try to have the not serious sort of vibes, mates down the pub sort of chat vibes. So, yeah, appreciate you coming on, mate. It's been a pleasure. I think this is the second or potentially even the third time you've been on Turfcast. Might be my hat trick. Might be yeah, my hat might trick. be. I'll get you a hat trick ball and send it in the post, mate. Um, but uh, thank you for coming on. Hope you have a, a wonderful season uh, and really enjoy yourselves, apart from on Saturday, of course. I hope you have a terrible weekend, but then enjoy yourself <laughs> after that, apart from when we play each other again at Turf Moor. Yeah, thank you, mate. Appreciate you coming on. Pleasure as always. Pleasure, mate. Thank you.